coming to you live, but not really. It is all pomp and no circumstance with Ryder Richards on LetUsThinkAboutIt.com, the amateur hour you should never tune into. Welcome back. This is Ryder Richards with Let Us Think About It. Okay, we're going to take a little break from Matthew Crawford's The World Beyond Your Head to tackle Eric Fromm's Escape from Freedom. And they kind of dovetail together, and we can talk more about that later. But the big question is, why would anyone want to escape from freedom, right? Isn't freedom just the best thing ever, right up there with sliced bread? Well, yeah, maybe, but in a complex system, any move will really produce countermanding forces. And humans, as well, we're kind of slow-evolving creatures, and by merely shouting something like, You're free! Well, we tend to encounter some problems. Because now what? What do we do with this freedom? And then the other problem is, you say somebody's free, but maybe it doesn't, you know, really line up with the reality on the ground of working 60 hours a week in a canning factory at age 11. So, while we might be able to hold up freedom as an ideological holy grail, But they'll never take our freedom! The reality is different. People actually do want to escape from freedom because they're kind of trapped in this weird world of not knowing who they are, but there's kind of a strain to be an independent, authentic, autonomous individual. And this can leave us alone and isolated from others, which of course hurts our socially evolved primate self. Now, as Karl Popper says, who was writing at the same time as Eric Fromm, the transition from the tribal or closed society to the more rational and free open society, yet it's not comfortable. And as a reaction, we keep returning to authoritarianism, where basically we're looking around for the boss so we know how to measure up or, you know, how to submit. Of course, the whole time I read this book, I related it to our current political climate, because this is not just about personal psychology, but it's also about how society shapes people and how their reaction in turn shapes the leaders we champion. So written around 1941, Fromm compares fascist Nazism and Hitler to America's liberal democracy and the types of people it produces and those who produce those systems. But, of course, he starts out with some history so we can get kind of a grasp of it and we can see what it looks like to move from a tribal closed society to a free and open society and why that move causes so many problems. A bit of a spoiler here, and we can dig into this more deeply in the next episode, which is part two of Escape from Freedom. I, uh, escaping more freedom of <laughs> Escape from Freedom Island. I don't know what we're going to call the sequel. Uh, but anyway, Fromm brings up that relegating your freedom is an escape mechanism. And in the case of fascism, there's this submittal to a power hierarchy so that people either are authoritarians or they submit to authoritarians. And both of these are kind of sadomasochistic in character. So people escape freedom by submitting. Of course, America is a democracy, so we face a slightly different set of problems, and this is related much more to populism. And namely, this is a tendency towards what he calls automaton conformity, where you escape the burden of responsibility by conforming. Yet, of course, we delusionally claim that we're free and unique, and this is mostly because everyone else around you is saying you're free, and like a good citizen, we just agree with them. <laughs> Yeah, so in the next episode, Escape from Freedom Island, we're going to be looking at these escape mechanisms and Fromm's solution to all of this, which is really to be a genuine individual and an authentic self. And this is how this ties back to Matthew Crawford's texts. But this being free, being unique, being authentic, it involves independent thinking, which of course most of us don't do, and spontaneity which is difficult and, of course, I personally have some arguments with. But until then, this episode that we're in right now will map out a historical and kind of psychological path that lays the groundwork for why modern man, in the midst of all this progress, has so many problems. Part 1. Medieval Times a long, long time ago, sitting in the muck of a squalid little village was a little boy named Reed. Reed was playing with scraps of leather from his dad's workbench. His dad, named Valerie, was the village cobbler. Valerie looked down upon his son and said, One day you will take over my job and you will do it the rest of your life. 
It's not an easy job or very fun, but it is necessary. And you will be protected by the king. Unless, of course, you mouth off and then he will have you impaled. <laughs> and then Valerie hit Reed in the head. Because apparently that's what you do in feudal societies. You just randomly smack people around or poke sharp objects into them. They weren't very good with emotions back then. Soon, his mom, Vicky, she comes in to stop Reed from squalling and she smacks him in the head too. Because, of course, this was a tough love family. Vicky proceeds to gossip about the seamstress and something to do with chickens and a priest. And after some circumlocutions, Vicky tells Valerie, This is your big chance to move up in the guild. Well, Valerie nervously blinks and swallows, because uh, he's afraid of all this ambition stuff the kids were talking about. The church says God wants you to work on your soul, not chase gold. And Valerie knew, as many people have forgotten, that money was less important than your soul. And also, wasn't there something in there about eating humble pie in heaven? Mm, yeah, well, Valerie didn't want to pass up a chance at that pie. But Vicky pointed to Reed sitting in the mud, sucking leather scraps, and said, Don't you want a better life for your son than sucking leather, Daddy? <laughs> and Valerie says, Hey, come on, we have a good life. Reed will have a good life, won't he? Right? Things aren't changing that much, are they? And thus, the middle class arises from the muck and squalor to become merchants and traders through ambition and competition. Trades unionized through powerful guilds, and soon petty bureaucracy and tyrants abounded, which all made money for the kingdom and brought in fancy stuff, which, by the way, kings really like. But this middle class was full of presumptuous upstarts who were smart enough to position themselves and take risks to better their condition, but of course, these middle classes had to pretend to be servile to the king. And that meant downplaying the idiocy of patriarchal lineage as a means to govern, lest the spoiled king just flay them alive and take all their stuff. So these people existed, these merchants existed between squalor and a kind of sociopathic tyrant. There is a lot of risk reward involved here. Equally, these people relied on the labor of the trades, so you couldn't get too uppity with the workers. But of course, if they had some rage, well, thank God there's still plenty of kids, cats, and peasants to smack around. Now, Eric Fromm, in Escape from Freedom, spends two chapters mapping out the transition from a relatively stable, closed society, where you had only small freedoms, limited relations, and a fixed role socially, to this burgeoning middle class, which was, of course, fraught with new anxieties, instability, and worse, veiled condescension. Now, Fromm says, with the beginning of capitalism, all classes of society started to move. There ceased to be a fixed place in the economic order which could be considered a natural, an unquestionable one. The individual was left alone. Everything depended on his own effort, not on the security of his traditional status. In other words, his was the risk and his was the gain. Now, this is a new kind of freedom. It's a risky freedom because it comes at the cost of stability. So we have talked before about Otto von Bismarck's social pyramid, which of course gave everyone a place in society. This was a hierarchy mapped over from the military, and it really ended up fixing social stability. What this provided was people could practice Bildung. Now, Bildung was this idea of lifelong learning and integration of philosophy and self-education to cultivate the learning of one's self. Yeah, so just imagine having so much stability that you could pursue lifelong goals of learning and integration. Okay, now forget that because it doesn't exist anymore. Okay, so the stability that was present allowed businesses to thrive and flourish as capitalism kind of opened up new freedoms to become something more. Now, these would be positive freedoms, but along the way, it started disrupting things and it dissolves traditional institutions such as the church and eventually the monarchy which of course is done by impaling the king's head on a pointy stake, <laughs> probably after smacking him around. Oh, okay, but in this new era of freedoms, rationality and competition, there were frictions with stabilizing traditional authorities who really just wanted people to do what they said. So now personally, I grew up religious, and you might find this next part a little bit boring, but I actually enjoyed hearing the complicated looping logics that actually strain credulity and what this can do to the human psyche. So Fromm discusses Martin Luther's Reformation, and he also discusses Calvinism, both of which gained power because they gave voice to the resentment of the middle class. 
Now, the Reformation used the increasingly individualistic shifts in societal thinking. Freedom through cutting out authority and wanting a voice, and he somehow mapped all these on to your salvation, where you now had direct access, a personal relationship, to God. Call him anytime you like. Now, the authority of the church, along with the abuses it perpetrated, was dissolved or ripped apart. Power to the peasants and all that stuff, right? Now, Fromm says Martin Luther's psychology and character structure exemplify the social structure of the time. Fromm quotes Luther a lot, leading to this kind of image of a tormented man. He hated others, especially the rebel. He hated himself. He hated life. And out of all this hatred came a passionate and desperate striving to be loved. His whole being was provided by fear, doubt, and inner isolation. And on this personal basis, he was to become the champion of social groups, which were in a very similar position psychologically. Martin Luther spoke of submission to God as voluntary, resulting from love, yet was prodded by a feeling of powerlessness and wickedness. Now, here's a quote. Godward, man has no free will, but is a captive, slave and servant either to the will of God or to the will of Satan. Yeah, so the Reformation was freedom from the church in a way, but man is really not free. Because you use your newfound freedom from authority to voluntarily submit to a higher authority. But of course, it's voluntary. It's out of love, I'm sure, even though there's lots and lots of threats about burning in hell. But as well, in the burgeoning middle class, they didn't want this authority over them. They wanted freedom. But of course, they're told that they can't earn their salvation from God the way they earned their place in society. So Luther says, you are tainted from birth. There is no escape. This all echoes the middle-class socioeconomic conundrum. You escape one set of rules only to be forced to submit to another more complicated set where you're supposed to somehow love or play up to your oppressor. I don't know, it's weird, right? And of course, this is the double bind. Of course, while the peasants had nothing to lose in the Reformation, this sort of revolution, and they could actually gain their souls by rebelling, the middle class had wealth and position to lose. And interestingly, a stable society needs a large middle class because if citizens have nothing to defend, only anxiety, precarity, and resentment, well, they might as well burn the society down. Hint, hint, economic inequality leads to revolution. So overall, Luther found a solution to the doubt and uncertainty that plagued him. And that was becoming an instrument in the hands of an overwhelmingly strong power outside of himself. He used his free will to give away his freedom. Now Fromm calls this masochism, rejecting your freedom of choice because the burden is too heavy to carry. And that, friends and foes, is the conclusion of the history religion lesson, but it leads us nimbly into the framework of doubt and insecurity that creates the sadomasochists of the 20th century. Part two, modern times. Doubt is the starting point of modern philosophy. The need to silence it had a most powerful stimulus on the development of modern philosophy and science. Science, so the scientific method, it just screams rational modernity, right? Science used to be about nature observation and experiments to prove things were false. And of course it got all rigorous and categorical, and of course philosophers wanted to be rigorous and right and they started categorizing things too. And weren't they also observing things and proving things wrong? Well, yes. And as we've mentioned before, and as Iris Murdoch says, philosophy in the past has played the game of science partly because it thought it was science. Since science is predicated upon doubt, which is falsification, the debunking of worldviews led to a debunking of authority, which led to the debunking of the social order all the way to the debunking of self, doubt everything. And this newly minted intellectualism, this modern doubt, it granted freedom from tradition, and the scientific revolution granted freedom from things like bloodletting and leeches, right? But not gonorrhea, so you know, keep doubting some things. But anyway, along the way, it was a societal and social wrecking ball, right? Leaving a previously well mapped out life in turmoil. Now, in our family scenario earlier, Vicky and Valerie, 
yeah, they had ambitious options. They also ended up getting those by doubting their place and security as tradespeople in this sort of feudal kingdom. Now, the doubt forced them to either compete or fall behind. And one look at grubby little leather-sucking Reed wallowing around, and they began to have lots and lots of doubts about their future. Now, this strain produces a social character spreading across society. And if you look at modern man, Eric Fromm says, he attempts to silence doubt in a compulsive striving for success and the belief that unlimited knowledge of facts can answer the question of certainty, or in the submission to a leader who assumes the responsibility for certainty, all these solutions can only eliminate the awareness of doubt. Yeah, but it does not eliminate the doubt itself, so the doubt just sits underneath all of this festering. Fromm goes on to say that doubt itself will not disappear until man overcomes his isolation and his place in the world becomes meaningful. So these are lovely words, right? To overcome isolation and find your meaningful place in the world? Yeah, but that's a heavy task in a disrupted and chaotic world. Now, is it any wonder that after attempting to find your personal meaning while working in a factory six day hours a week, you find you're more isolated than ever somehow? And you really just want to shed this burden, the burden to be unique, to be responsible, to use this gift of freedom responsibly. So Martin Luther, he is a good example of this freedom getting warped because while he tore down external authorities of the church, cutting out the middleman between you and salvation, his God was also an uncaring tyrant who you were supposed to love, which immediately deprived all these newly freed people of their self-confidence and human dignity. Luther says, we are not our own, and he commands people to submit to a higher power. But this time, don't do it because the king says to, do it because it's your own free will. Choose to be unfree with the freedom I provided you. So these people did, right? They chose to be unfree, and freshly stripped of confidence and dignity, they had no spine left to fight the secular authority, which meant they chose to be unfree at work as well. But... Humans are complicated, and so they could feel better about all the submission, they created elaborate fictions linking wealth with being among God's chosen. Or some of them hung on to national myths to make sure that their sense of exploitation and labor had value. As Max Weber says, man became his own slave driver, as the once external compulsion of work became internalized. And this economic system that is intensely individualistic, driven almost solely by self-interest, Individuals are in competition, and this makes them feel even more alone and isolated. <sighs> Yet, we must not forget, right? Man is a social creature, and isolation is possibly the worst pain imaginable, driving people mad. Now, in the name of pursuing his individuality and freedom, our once little Reed has gotten a taste for leather. And he entered the shoe business with a passion, proving to be a good shoe merchant. Now, Reed was too busy to spend time with decrepit Valerie and Vicky. So he isolated them as he isolated himself. He's attempting to climb up and into the pious class by earning more and more money wearing tight leather and fashionable shoes. Now he's definitely exercising his strong willpower. Reed places the utmost value on his intellect as good old Immanuel Kant suggests. You must vigilantly control yourself now that the external authorities are absent. Still, the will and intellect alone do not make for a total person. They might be good watchdogs, but those sensual emotions, they're all tied up in there. Well, they're starting to act up a little bit more and a little bit more. And along the way, Reed starts wondering why his self is acting out against his self. But Reed, of course, is also too busy for too much inward contemplation. <sighs> busy in this fast, furious, modern life. But he looks to his social self, the way others view him for who he is. Heck, I mean, these people tell him who he is. He's a shoe man, so that's who he is. Now, as disheartening as all this may be, it's also understandable that in kind of a Marxian or Hegelian fashion, our despairing Reed feels insignificant, powerless, and alienated. He's merely a cog in the machine he helped to build, but he cannot control. Now, there's also a truth here that's too jarring to look at directly. But in a capitalist, manufacturing, economic society, all his relationships have become transactions. And even his relationship to himself, the way he treats himself, is as if he is a commodity. 
His social self, that forced jocular vitality wearing nice shoes, well, sure, it makes him likable. He is his own advertisement for himself as a product, gauging others' reactions as a mean to assess his own self-esteem. Thus Reed is perpetually plagued by doubt and insignificance. In a new world, free of all those stifling authorities, with all this new technology and commodities to empower your freedom, the people are becoming more hollow, less whole, more enmeshed in more dependencies that are less fulfilling. They're more frantic, more trapped in a world demanding you gleefully, maniacally embrace your freedoms. Now, as we wrap up this short episode on the history and character that leads to craving an escape from freedom, we need to also consider where our buddy Reed will end up. We find the modern man with all these freedoms, he doesn't really know how to be or to find his genuine self. And out of frustration and despair, a dark shadow underlies the lies of material and social progress. Progress has left the individual behind. And just so you know, it wasn't as if there weren't canaries in the mind tweeting the approaching nihilism and plight of the individual. Nietzsche, for instance, offered the concept of the Superman, the Ubermunch, as the negation of this insignificant, directionless individual. Kierkegaard described the helpless individual tormented by doubt and overwhelmed by loneliness. And Kafka, in his surrealist fashion, described the plight of the modern man in the castle, where a man wants to get in touch with the mysterious inhabitants who will show him his place in the world, but he never succeeds, wandering alone and lost until he dies. But of course, in a more popular vein, we should look at Mickey Mouse. Part 3, Mickey Mouse. So remember a few episodes ago, Matthew Crawford talked about the Mickey Mouse Club show and the Mouse Could Do Her. And he mentioned that in older cartoons, the world was a dangerous place that fought back against you. Objects had a mind of their own and were animated and full of vitality. Now, Eric Fromm discusses Walt Disney's choice of a mouse, Mickey Mouse, as the hero of his cartoons. Considering the times, this is a strange mascot to relate to, because in general, mice are vermin to be eradicated. This isn't some sort of hippogriff or a lion, but rather something that scurries in the dark. Yet in a time where the world is chaotic and people feel powerless, under attack, and perhaps dreaming of a dark hole into which they could escape to survive, the public could relate to the mouse and cheer his narrow escapes from the brutal forces of nature or wicked predators. Through the mouse, people were finding some sort of heartening solidarity. They too may find relief from an uncaring world that found them insignificant, powerless, and was busily attempting to squash and eradicate them. So the question is, who are we attuned to now in media? What character do we not worship, but identify with? All right, thank you very much. Next episode, we're going to continue the dark story of our friend Reed. As he attempts to survive in an uncaring world that tells him he is free to do as he wishes, free from restraint, and yet with all this freedom, he is more lost than ever. Will he return to fascism and submit to an authoritarian? Or will he simply shut down his cognitive faculties and become a smiling automaton swayed by the popularity of the crowd? Or... Will he find his authentic self despite a society stacking the deck against him? Who knows? <laughs> Wait until next week. All right. Thank you so much for listening. And a shout out to Vicky Reed and Valerie for subscribing to the podcast and supporting the efforts that have been sunk into the show. Now, of course, if you're interested in learning more, maybe reading a breakdown of each episode, watching this on YouTube, or even supporting the show through a small monthly donation, please visit LetUsThinkAboutIt.com. Once again, this is Ryder Richards, and until next week, stay safe.